Well, praise the Lord, everyone. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we have made the conscious decision to rejoice and be glad in it. We are grateful for our one more day walking on the topsoil. Thank God for all that he has done for us and what he's going to do for us. We bring you greetings from uh, the city of Chandler, Arizona, where I am uh, Bishop George McCree, pastor of New Vision Christian Fellowship. The address of our church is 9350 East Brown Road in Mesa, Arizona. And that is just east of Ellsworth Road on Brown Road. We're grateful that you have taken the opportunity to come and to be with us on today. And uh, we trust something will be said uh, that will uh, cause you to grow higher in the Lord. Before we get into our lesson, we want to uh, invite you out to our, our, our service on Sunday, uh, which will be the last Sunday in June. Uh, we have as our, our guest speaker, we have Elder Calvin Harris. Elder Calvin Harris, he blessed us a few months ago um, as he brought forth the word of God. And we're looking forward to hearing what God has to say through him. Man, that'll be Sunday. Our service begins at 2 p.m. And we'd love to have you come out and be with us. Tonight's lesson is going to be found in the book of Luke chapter number 15. Let's pray for those who are, are challenged right now, whether it is with still with COVID, whether the challenge is in their physical bodies, medical conditions, emotional conditions, spiritual conditions, financial conditions, relational uh, shifts. Difficulties in these different areas, we ask God's blessing to be upon you. I thank God that he is a God that knows all and he is able to deliver in whatever area you find that there is a need. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and we Thank you for life, health, and strength. One more day, my Father, walking on the topsoil, we say thank you. Father, we ask that you would look upon those that are challenged, Lord, and we ask that, Lord, that you would just bring them out. Help them, my Father, to know that they are going through a challenge, which means that, God, you never meant for them to stay in it, but to simply go through. So, Father, we pray that you give us that go-through spirit. We pray that you would just bless us, Lord, in our homes. And, God, wherever the needs are, look upon Lord, those that have been on our prayer list. I, I pray for, for Pastor Spivey and Lady Spivey tonight in, in Denver, Colorado. Father, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will let your perfect will be done in, in the situation that they are going through. Father, you are able to bring comfort. You're able to lift us up where our heads are hung down. Father, strengthen them right now in the name of Jesus. All of those that are on our prayer list, uh, those who have been on our prayer list for a while, Lord, you are able to take each of them off of the prayer list, not through death, Lord, but through life, bringing life into their bodies, life into their situations, Lord. Let your will be done in Jesus' name. Now for the task at hand, we pray that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive. Father, we ask that you would just look upon us as a vessel and ask that you would give us, Lord Jesus, the, the tongue, our tongue would be the pen of a ready writer. Father, we pray, Lord Jesus, that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart will be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's go to Luke chapter 15. We are grateful um, as we we look at Luke chapter 15, we talked about uh, the 15th, in the 15th chapter on Sunday, which was Father's Day. 
And we wanna publicly uh, thank our first lady uh, for putting together some things for our fathers. We appreciate uh, those things that she did for us. And all of you who, who said, Pastor, we appreciate you. I uh, had a, uh, uh, a disc, uh, a dish rather, that was given to me and my father's picture was, was in that. And I, I thought that was uh, so, so kind of uh, Minister uh, Ronaldo Alexis uh, to have that made up for us. And it was just very, very kind. And all of you who, who did something for us, we, we appreciate you for that. All right, Luke chapter 15. We're gonna be going through it. Um, uh, so I just wanna open up uh, with the first verse and go from there. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him, speaking about Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes com complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So uh, in this first verse of scripture, we find that there's always someone that's gonna talk about what it is that you're doing. If they see it as something that's negative, they're going to talk about it. I've learned over the years that people will talk about you when you do good and talk about you when you do bad. So um, you can make it up in your mind that you're going to move forward in Christ and ask God to just to bless them as we move forward or uh, succumb to, to the complaining, succumb to uh, the accusations, succumb to their judgment on your life. I made up my, uh, made up my mind that I, I'm just not gonna do that anymore. You know, if you don't like me, fine, don't like me. <laughs> uh, if you see, uh, how God has given us his word and you don't agree with it. Well, if you don't agree with it, just, just don't agree with it. But it's another thing when you begin to talk something, if it's something that you haven't received a revelation over. All right, enough of that. So Jesus spoke this parable onto them. Now, Luke chapter 15, has been called the lost and found department of the Bible. In it, we find uh, the lost sheep that was brought home with joy, the lost silver coin that was found with joy, and the lost son that was a prodigal, uh, but returned to the father's house and was received with great joy. These parables speak of the idea of reconciliation and hope. Yet when we consider Jesus's audience, there is a much deeper truth. Jesus shows the sinners, the publicans, the scribes and the Pharisees what God is really like, what he's like. Some people think the most important question in life is, do you believe in God? A Gallup poll a few years ago found 81% of Americans expressed belief when asked that simple question, do you believe in God? Now this 81% is down uh, from 87% in 2017, and a record low for this question, which had first been asked in 1944, when 96% of the people believed. It reached its highest, which was 98% in, 19, in the 1950s and 1960s. So we see that, that uh, the belief system of we as Americans have plummeted. Uh, the question is, do you 
believe in God. But a more important question is, what kind of God do you believe in? You can believe in God, but if you have a false concept of God, you are no better off than an atheist. You see, everyone in Jesus's audience had their own idea of what God was like. Today, we have the, the Muslims, the Hindu, the atheists, the New Agers, and the like, who have their own ideas of what God is like. So then when Jesus comes, Jesus came to the earth to show us exactly what God is like. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus shares three beautiful stories that paint a portrait of the character and nature of God. The first we find is the lost sheep. And what we find about God is this. Through that parable, we, it shows us the caring, number one, and the seeking, number two, nature of God. In the second parable of the lost coin, we show this side of God. It is showing us how much God values in each of us. And then uh, the story of the prodigal son. The complete story is a story from ruin to restoration. Now, uh, when we talk about the prodigal, uh, the word prodigal means extravagant reckless, or without limits. We'll get into that third one, which is what, what our major theme was for our lesson on Sunday. We'll get back to some of that, but I, I, I want us to focus first on uh, the other two parables. The first is the parable of the lost sheep. Verse number four says, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which was lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me. I have found the sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over the one sinner who repents than over the 99 just persons who need no repentance. I, I want you to see uh, the, the, the nature of, of the shepherd, the shepherd leaving uh, the 99 and going after the one. Uh, one of, of uh, I, I don't wanna say my favorite movies, but it's, it, it's up in the, the probably the, the um, top 10 movies. I, I like, um, Star Trek, and when they did the one that was called the Wrath of Khan, there was a, a phrase that, that was said. And the phrase was, the need of the one outweighed the needs of the many. The needs of the many is how it started. The needs of the many outweighed the needs of the few or the one. But by the end of the story, we found out by uh, the sacrifices that were made, uh, it is now said that the needs of the one outweighed the needs of the many. And that was in uh, one of the, 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 the next stories or movies that came out about Star Trek. <clears throat> but this, it, it's clear 
The needs of the one in this passage outweigh the needs of the many. You and I serve a God that will go and seek to find that one which is lost. The shepherd never gives up on finding the lost sheep. Scripture goes on to say, uh, uh, when he was found, he, he rejoiced. When he was found, the shepherd does not beat him down. The shepherd does not talk about him and say, why did you get yourself lost? He doesn't tell him what he should have done. But when he finds him, he lays him on his shoulder, and the scripture says, rejoicing. And this is the picture of the God that we serve. Now, you can see the picture of God, the God of wrath. You can see the picture of God as the God of, of judgment, the God that will send you to hell. But what I see in this, these passages is a God that is caring, a God that is loving, that a God that has compassion. First Peter 5 and 7 says, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So what we can learn from that is, is that when we're lost, and not just physically lost or even spiritual lost, when we're in a, a place where we uh, have no understanding or where we're, we're, we're lost about a particular situation, we're lost about uh, a, a health condition, we're, we're lost uh, about your, your, your job and getting a job, those, those particular things. When you are lost, Christ is right there. And he can take you up in his arms and place you on his shoulder. Why? Because he cares for you. Casting all your cares upon him, he cares for you. And he rejoices and encourages his family and friends, neighbors also, to rejoice. Parable number two, the parable of the lost coin, beginning at verse number eight. Or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner who repents. Thank God. So this parable points to the fact that that you are valuable. You're 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 like the silver coin. And when we were away, we were lost. Here, what does the woman do? The woman searches the house carefully. The scripture says she sweeps the house. She turns on all the lights, if you will. And she begins to search for that. Now notice in, in uh, the first one, it was the shepherd, the shepherd. Uh, you can see that as the, the, the man of God, man or woman of God, the pastor that goes out when, when one of the flock has been lost and he or she goes out and tries to find them and bring them back into relationship with God. Here, the coin, uh, he, he, he talks about it's a woman. And when you think about woman, we, we can, can see that there is a parallel between the woman 
and the church. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. The church is to be the one that a man looks out and searches, sweeps here and there, looks under the sofa, looks under uh, the chairs, looks under the bed, searching for that one of value. Brothers and sisters, this is the mission of the church, is to, when we see that there is value, when we see that there is value in an individual, our job is to bring that to light. Hear me. Our job is to bring that to light. Bring what? The value of an individual out. And they need to know, I, I said in, in the lesson on Sunday, that, that, that they're appreciated, they're valued. And we need to let our sons and daughters know that they are appreciated and they are valued. Christ is saying through this parable that you are valuable and I will search here and there because you are valuable to me. So the woman searches, the scripture says, carefully. And that word carefully means with awareness uh, how she looked for the coin. It was with awareness. It was it was done wisely and it was done gently. So that's the second parable. The main parable that we talk about uh, uh, mostly uh, in Christendom uh, is uh, the prodigal son. And that is the one son that was lost. Well, uh, if we have time to get to it, actually there were both sons that were lost. One was lost outside of the house and the other was lost in the house. All right, maybe we'll get to it or not. We've got a lot, a lot of ground to cover today. In this parable, Jesus guides us through the downward journey of the son as he moves from self-will to selfishness, then separation, from separation to starvation. Then Jesus allows us to experience his climb. What was the climb from? His realization of where he was to resolution, from resolution to repentance, and from repentance to reunion. He realizes where he is. We'll get to it in the hall, but he realizes he's, he's got all the way down to the bottom. Then resolution, he resolves within himself what he had. He understands my father has food, much food, and I'm here starving. So he resolves that he's going to go back to his father. And in so doing, his mind is set straight because he has a repentance in his mind and in his heart. Father, I'm no longer worthy to become your son. Make me a hired servant. Then we find the reunion when the father sees him coming afar off. He runs to him uh, and so on and so forth. He kisses his neck. He gets him a robe. He gets him a ring. And we'll talk about the symbolism that are in those particular things and the fatted calf. Jesus uses these three parables to show us what our father is really like. We said that earlier. In this third parable, the text begins with a certain man blessed with two sons. They have a good father. He's a good father. This story speaks more of the father's relationship with his son than anything else. 
Notice the honesty and openness of their relationship. You can hear it in their communication. Each member of the family knows that they are appreciated and valued. One of the things that you don't find out in, in uh, this parable is, is that there was fightings going on between the father and the sons. You, you don't see that in scripture. They had a positive relationship. But all of us at some point in time are challenged one way or another. Amen. What is drawing us is, is the world. What is drawing us are the sensual things of this world the carnality of this world. Uh, it's important for us that we continue to let our children know, I said this on Sunday, that they are appreciated and valued. I said that then and I said it a couple of minutes ago and, and I, I need to drive that point home today. Whether your, your, your children are, are toddlers or they're uh, preteens or teenagers or or if they're 40 years old, they need to know from you that they are valued. And one thing I love about, about the Lord is I see through the things that he does is that he values us. Amen. When others, uh, what, what does a song say? Uh, when others are all around me, uh, saw the worst in me, he saw the best in me. That's the God that we serve who sees the best in you. So regardless of what has happened in your life or what you're going through today, understand that God values you and he sees the best in you. He sees the finished product. He sees how great you are. He sees the greatness in you. Yes, we each have weaknesses, but his focus is not on the weaknesses, but the greatness. And I remember reading the story of, of David and Abigail. And when I, I, I read about Abigail, Abigail saw the best in David and understand that, that uh, in this in our relationships on the human level. We need to start seeing the best in people. We quickly point out the negatives. We point out their weaknesses. We, we point out their troublesome areas in their lives. Amen, we, we bring that to light. But what we need to bring to light is their greatness. Now, as I am teaching this, understand that I'm also receiving this. God is telling me as a pastor that I need to, to speak life. I, I need to not to uh, uh, think about the negative things that, that people do, but I need to focus in on the greatness that is within them. My son and my daughters, my grandsons and my granddaughter. Paul Paul loves you and he wants to see the best. I see the best in you. And though there are other things that are going on in each of your lives, I want the best for you. I want you to do better than me. Amen, that's my prayer, my desire. Relationship building can be challenging. But we must never underestimate the value of a good relationship. See, if you got a good relationship, you can go, you can go through just about anything. You can go through hell and high waters. But if you got a good relationship, a solid relationship, there's somebody in it with you, and you together can weather any storm in this life. The good father in, in the, the text had two loving, supportive, and caring sons. Again, we are not told what caused the young son to want to leave home, but we can speculate. We want to get out on our own. 
That's our desire to get out on our own. Our desire is to see the world. Our desire is, is to move from where I am to a place that I've never been before. Okay. That's that's good. That, that's good to want to, to broaden your, your horizon, broaden your perspective. That, that's always good. But we ought to take care when we're doing that, that we are, are careful that we are our steps, excuse me, our steps are being ordered by the Lord, that God is, is giving his approval on the steps that we take. The younger son was confident that he was free to talk to his father about anything. And again, I've got to drive this point home. As parents, do our children have the confidence in us to talk to us about anything? Or, or have we put up a wall that I'm, I'm the parent, you're the child, we're not friends. Well, uh, I understand that you, you, you are a parent and, and there are, are some, some things that perhaps we're not on the same, same level on. But by the same token, we, we, we cannot build up walls with our children through um, how we talk to them. We, we can't uh, cause them to be afraid of us. Man, my daughters told me one time, well, I guess, I guess I'm the parent that, that, that has to be the, uh, the, the firm one in, in, in her relationship with, with her child. Well, there is, there is also, there is a, a middle ground. There, there is, there's a balance. That's the word I'm looking for. There is a balance. Amen. We don't want to become harsh in what we do. A matter of fact, the, the, the scripture tells us fathers, and in this case, uh, parents, um, provoke not your children to, to anger. He says, don't exasperate your children. He says, because if you do that, uh, they'll get to the point where uh, they, they won't accept what you have to say, or they will, they will not come to you when it's something that is very, very important. I want those of you who God has, has, has given us um, the, uh, to be the under shepherd of, I, I want you to be able to come to me and talk to me about anything. And, and or should, should I say, talk to me about everything. Um, not that you have, have to do that. Not that you need my approval on any decisions that you make. But I'm saying that, that we ought to have a relationship where you can come and talk to me about different things. And I trust that, that we will not be a father or a pastor that is judgmental. Amen. Yes, there, there may be some correction that needs to be made, um, but it's all done in love. We, we don't, the Bible says we speak the truth in love. There is a way how to do what it is that you do. And this father knew how to handle his younger son because he had been with his son all of his son's life, both of them. And he knew how to deal with them. But it's interesting uh, how he looks at his sons and he, he, he does not condemn uh, the decision that he's, he's going to make. But he he supports not the bad decision per se, but he supports his son, and that's where the the difference has to be made between the situation or the circumstance and the person. Man, that's where we must draw draw the line. Uh, we have to recognize that we can support the individual without supporting uh, the sin or supporting the bad decision. You can support that individual. 
what God knows, what God does, what, what does Jesus do? What Jesus does, excuse me, lets us know about the Father. The parable lets us know about this Father. And uh, we touched on this on Sunday. The Father uh, was available. First is availability. The second is generosity. The third is influential. The fourth is forgiving. And the fifth is compassionate. So these characteristics, or these are the nature of this father. And it ought to be the nature of, of all of us who claim to be sons and daughters of God. All of us, if God has entrusted anybody in your life, then this is the attributes that you must possess. Availability, generosity, influential, forgiving, and compassion. This father, number one, was available. Beginning at verse number 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. This father and son had such a beautiful relationship that the son felt comfortable meeting with his father on this sensitive subject. Sensitive subjects. Please note that. If our children cannot come to us with a sensitive subject, if they cannot unburden themselves, if they cannot share their feelings, sometimes uh, the feelings that come from our sons and daughters may be what you would call raw. Uh, they're, they're unfiltered. And we get caught up in the rawness of, the, of what's going on rather than the substance of what's going on. They must feel that they can come to us and that they can share anything. Now, I know that in our, our heads, because we are human, there may be some, some judgments going on in our heads, but we've gotta be careful not to speak those things out, but listen to where they are. I believe that this, this father listened to where, what his son was saying. And I believe that he saw this come. I don't believe that, that this, this took his father by surprise, but through what the son had been doing leading up to this, I, I believe that the father knew the direction that he was going. So he had to make a decision. Okay, I know that it's going in this direction and I've got to be prepared to render support to my son as, as the shepherd renders support to the, to the sheep that was lost. I've got to be able to render support when he gets lost that I will seek and I will find him. When he gets lost, I will not judge him. When he gets lost, I will not put him down. You find this in this passage, how this father does. And I know that we're not there yet. Amen. Some of us have arrived. Uh, no, some of you have arrived. I, I haven't arrived there yet. But I'm getting there where I... I fall back on God's mercies, where I fall back on God's grace, where I don't want to put people down because of what has been done in their life. I need to support them right where they are. Remember that the idea in that day was that they were to get on God's level. Amen. The scribes and the Pharisees. This is, this is how things work. But when we look at, at the parables and when we look at the life of Jesus, 
Jesus was not trying to get us to where he was. He came to where we are. And that's the blessing. That's the blessing. He will find us right where we are. If it's in the hog pen, he'll find us. If, if, if we're in trouble with the law, he'll find us. If we have problems in our flesh, he'll find us. Wherever it is that we are, we serve a Jesus that will find you right where you are and will not rebuke you, will not uh, pass judgment on you. But as in the first parable, he will love on you. That's what you and I must learn to do. We must learn to love on one another. I'm not, I'm, I, I confess, I'm, I haven't got there yet, but I'm on the road. I, 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 some areas, you know, I, I, I'm moving toward that, but I haven't got there. And guess what? With me saying this in the presence of you says that, that, that I, I am humbling myself before God. And I'm saying, God, that this is an area that I'm working on. And I believe that God will help me, that I would, would, would see clearer, see past the, 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 uh, the surface, see past what, what is, is going on in front and look down into the heart. Man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh at the heart. And so we must ask God that we would, we would focus in on the inner portion of that individual. This father saw what was going on with his son. And it sounds to me like even before the son opened his mouth and say what he, he desired, his father already knew what it was going to happen. Bible speaks about God in, in the book of Isaiah, probably around the 46th verse, when he says that, that, uh, that, that God declares the end from the beginning. In other words, our father knows the end first. In other words, the father knew that his son was going to return. That's why he was looking out for him every day. He knew that he was going to return. We've got to have that type of faith, knowing that our sons, our daughters, our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why it's important to you as, as, as a child of God in parable number two, that the, the woman, which is a type of the church, goes out and seeks out for that which is valuable. New Vision Christian Fellowship. There are, there are, are people that have been on uh, been a part of our church and we have not seen the value in them and we have not gone out to them if you're watching we love you amen and and we need you back in fellowship with us right where you are no judgment no judgment but recognizing that god wants us to be in relationship because there's strength in relationship there is power in relationship there is safety. Your safety is in relationships. Wow, I didn't need, mean to go all over there. Praise Jesus. The father was available. He was understanding. And he was responsive. The good father was generous. And he divided unto them his living. Again, he did divide unto him, the younger son, he divided unto them, the older and the younger son, okay? This young man was going to get, um, wanting to give, get all that he was gonna give when his father died. His father does as, as uh, some uh, do nowadays. Uh, we've seen that in, in there are a, a number of churches where we found that uh, the, the pastor passed on the baton uh, to his son or daughter or her son or her daughter. Uh, the pastor passed it on while they were yet living uh, so that there would be no issues about the church. You knew his will because he did it while they were yet living. So everybody 
understood that this was, was to be the case. This father did that. He, he gave to them what was they were going to receive. All right. The father is generous and liberal without being controlling. I know the, the father probably would have desired better choices made by his son, but he sees that his son has made up his mind. His son may not have learned all the lessons he needed, but the father sees some growth in him. That's what we're talking about, the value. That's what we're talking about, looking at the inner person, that there are things uh, that, that the individual possesses. That's not surface. Not, uh, knowing, the Bible says that we, we ought to know them that labor among us. Uh, one of the, uh, the shortcomings that I am as a pastor is really knowing each of you to the place where I know where you fit best. And I, I'm sorry for that. Understand that it's, it's my job to look inside of what you are and what you have and what your needs are. This father knew that. His son may not have learned all the lessons he needed to, but the father saw growth. This is a, a new concept. That God, well, no, it's not a new concept. But let me say this, God who has all power and authority allows us free will. God has given man free will from Adam and from Adam all the way up to 2023 and beyond. God gives us free will. He can make you do something, okay? He can bend your will to his will. But what he does, the Bible tells us with loving kindness, have I drawn you. How God deals with this is through uh, his love, his tender mercies that are renewed each day. The grace, the unmerited favor that he gives us. And through this, we become uh, agents where we want to serve him because he's just that good. Amen. That's a good message in itself. He's just that good. You have the freedom to make choices. After a few days, the, uh, the son took his journey to a far country. There, uh, he wasted everything that he had. He, he spent all of his money. And let me tell you something. When you have money, when you have substance, you'll always have quote unquote friends. They're not really friends, but that's why I put a, a quotation in there because they like being around you because you pick up the tab. Oh yeah, they, they, they like being around you, amen, when, when you are, are the one that's always giving. Yeah. I said this on Sunday, there are twins. In, in this passage. Now I'm not talking about the older and the younger son, but the twin brothers in this are want and waste. He who wastes will soon come to want. The young man wasted his lib, wasted the monies that he had. And when you waste your money, when you come down and out, then you are in want. Yet the father was generous knowing what his son may do and the bad choices that he may make. Good father was influential. Fathers are always influential. Good fathers will have a positive influence on their children. Even though the younger son was away from home, the father's training and influence is still, to a certain extent, guiding him. 
when he became so hungry that he would eat the, the, the corn on the cob that was in the pig slop, he would not. The boy somehow held on to his father's teaching. We used to sing a, a, a song every Sunday uh, as we gathered together for Sunday school. And the song said, what you are, speak so loud that the world can't hear what you say. They're looking at your walk, not listening to your talk. They're judging from your actions every day. Now don't believe that you'll deceive by claiming what you've never known. They'll accept what they see and know what you be. They're judging from your life alone. Solomon in, in Proverbs 22 and six says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Uh, in uh, the amplified classic version, I believe it is, he says, train up a child in the way that he should go and in keeping with his individual gift or bent. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Uh, how, how, he is, how he is bent or how he is gifted. When a person is gifted in a particular area, uh, they will not stray from that. When a person is, uh, if they're bent, they, they love to cook. My son uh, loves, loves to cook. Uh, he went and got his culinary uh, degree and he's, he's cooking, he likes to cook. So when you're doing something that, that you love, a man, work is a little more easy because it's something that is in you. Uh, this father not only gave him uh, uh, what he needed to know about the Jewish faith, but also about uh, how to do. He was, he was a, a, a young man that worked so he wasn't afraid to get out there and work. Uh, he does not um, resort to, to robbery. He doesn't resort to stealing or, or, or cheating someone, but he resorts back to what his father had taught him. And that is to get out and work. All right, I'm moving fast here. The young man had been raised up working. So even in his desperate situation, he remembered his father's instructions. He got a job. The father's influence caused him to get a job. Even though the Jews eating pig was prohibited uh, by Jewish law, we found him yet working in the pig pen. Let me tell you this, things can get so bad in one's life that you may be driven to do something that you never thought you would possibly do. But his father's influence also caused him to develop a line in his life. Some place that he would not cross, the line in the sand. He was not raised to dine with the swine. The father's influence caused him to remember who he was and who he belonged to. Father's influence caused him to take responsibility for his actions and to make some needed decisions. I'm going to go back to daddy. Good father was available, generous, influential, and he was. Forgiving, the father forgave him. And when he came to himself, the son, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough in spare, to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no longer worthy to be called your son, Make me one of your hired servants. He comes back in his mind. He, has, he, he, he recognizes what he has done. 
uh, he recognizes. In so doing, he thinks, though, because of the sins that he had committed, he thinks that he is no longer a son. He thinks that he's not going to be received as a son. So he says, make me a hired servant. He does not understand that when he left a clean son, got there and was a dirty son, he was still a son. Brothers and sisters, I got to, I got to encourage you today. I, I, I got to put this in your spirit. I don't care what it is you're done. You're still a son. You're still a daughter. And the father loves you. And the father wants you to return in fellowship with him. The father still looks for his son to return. His faith was, was active in that he was looking for the manifestation of that which he hoped for, that which he prayed for. Then he saw him, the Bible says, a great way off. I can tell that that's my son by the way he walks. I can tell that's my son. He, he, he might be dragging it. That's my son. The father was compassionate. He runs to him. He, he falls on his neck. He kisses him. The son still has the stench of, of, of the hog pin on him. The son is still dirty from his labor and his long walk home. You, you see, uh, when, when you start your journey, when you have money, your head is up. You have, you, you have a spring in your step. You, 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 are, you are hopeful. You are, oh, you're just on your way. He has to walk back the same path that he had come down. And when he comes, he's tired. He is, he's dirty. He's, he, 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 he's in his mind. He doesn't know how he's going to be received. All of these things does not have his head up, but has his head down. But here it is, his father. I got less than three minutes, so let me say this. The savior runs toward the sinner. The father's extravagant forgiveness is unfolded in each of these things. He kisses him. The kiss, now you need to write this down. The kiss means that fellowship has been restored. The ring that's put on his finger means that the position of authority has been restored. The robe, this means his father has covered him. The shoes means that he is not a servant, but a son. And the party, the party, means he is back in fellowship, not only with the family, but also with the community. He experiences the full measure of the Father's mercy and the Father's grace. All right, we're out of time, not out of word, but out of time. We certainly appreciate the word that has gone forth on tonight. We trust that you receive something from uh, the word that was presented today. And if you find yourself that, that you are watching this and you are lost in your sins, amen. We are extending to you today, amen. Right where you are is now an altar. You can ask the Father to receive you. If you've been out and haven't been in fellowship with him, God is opening up his arms to receive you back. My son, which was lost, is now found. My, my son, my, my daughter, which was blind, now sees. My, my, my son, my daughter, which was crippled, is now healed. My son, my daughter, which was on drugs, has now been restored to good health. 
That's the God that we serve. This is Bishop George McCray, pastor of New Vision Christian Fellowship. The address of our church is 9350, amen, East Brown Road on, in Mesa, Arizona. That's just east of Ellsworth. Our service times are on Sundays at 2 p.m. And we love to have you come out and be with us. This Sunday, Elder Calvin Harris is going to be our speaker, and we're looking forward to hearing what God has to say to us through this vessel. So come on out and be with us, amen. Have fellowship with us, amen, because one thing you cannot do in your home is have fellowship. You can't touch one another. You can't hear someone encouraging you particularly with what you're going through and can pray with you and can offer sound advice. So come on out and be with us. God bless you in Jesus' name is our prayer. Be well in Jesus' name.